reality of heaven in this place. Thank you, Jesus. When it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. So we heard last night. When it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. Let's see that reality today. When it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. Open our eyes. When it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. We're renewing our minds. Because there's victory in the blood of Jesus. There's victory in the blood of Jesus. Still victory in the blood of Jesus. Because it washes white as snow. There's salvation in the blood of Good morning, everyone. The Don Wells of Living Stones Men's Ministry. We have been enjoying a super weekend here. Uh, but just want to tell you that it's just an honor for me to lead this ministry. I look around the room and I look at these guys, and I just feel so, so blessed because uh, they're just a great bunch of people. They would just love one another. They love these gatherings that we have. Uh, the time that we have together, the, the relationships that, that get formed. And uh, the Lord gave me these three words one time called building supportive relationships. And that's what we've been doing. We do, this is our, I think, fourth, we started in 2019 doing fall retreats. And this is the second time here for Camp Getty. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. In this place, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Let your glory fall, let your glory. Let your miracles happen here. Wash over us here. Show yourself amazing ways. Speak to our hearts, I pray. Welcome. You're welcome here. Holy Spirit, move in this place. You are welcome here. Oh, what a joy to be back in Nova Scotia. I had a great time last time I was here. And love the hunger I sensed in the people. And John Rodham has been a dear friend of mine for a long time and wanted us to come up here. And I got to bring my wife up. She's traveling with Holly all over the place. And we're going to talk about recalibration. And I love the Lord's presence. Amen. The Lord's presence is sweet here tonight. I love when in Luke 2 that it said that Mary and Joseph left the feast of the Passover and assumed that Jesus was with them and took off down the road and found out that Jesus wasn't with them. I think we've all been in the same place that Mary and Joseph were. Sometimes we take off and assume that Jesus is with us and we find out that we've left him somewhere. It's amazing how when you go back to wherever you lost him that you find him waiting for you. And I just sense the Lord's presence is going to be here this weekend and that there's going to be a lot of prophetic things that are going to happen. There's going to be a lot of different things that are happening. But we want to recalibrate. And like, uh, a little bit up, yeah, that would probably help. 
like Don shared about the word recalibrate, I had to go look it up. There's a lot of things about calibration and recalibrate and how you spiritualize a really a, a term that has to do a lot with mechanisms and machinery and gauges and things. But it says an intentional recalibration and envisioning of one's life based on God's universal and unique purpose for every person. So for me, over the last few years, there's been a lot of recalibrations. I pastored a church for 32 and a quarter years. I started the church in Everett, Washington, and four and a half years ago, my son became the senior pastor. And God took me into a ministry in all kinds of places and ways. I've never been bored or had a problem doing things, but I had to recalibrate. The pandemic made us recalibrate. A lot of us were not ready for what happened. And still, some ways, the church is still recalibrating. I think one of the recalibrations is to get our eyes back on Jesus and off all the other things that have distracted us from Jesus. And my prayer for this weekend is we recalibrate that when we leave here, people will know that we've been with Jesus. And I think, I think the Lord's going to change my message today, so I'm going to leave my notes here. I already felt that as we worship. And we're, we're surrounded by things today. And, and the worship leader, I just have the songs, I just felt like the Lord said to change your message, and I, I obey him. I don't care what anybody else thinks, I obey him. I want to be in the presence of Jesus. I want to I know him. I, and as you get older, you don't really care so much what people think anymore. You realize you wasted a lot of your life worrying what everybody else thinks, and half the, about nine out of ten times, they weren't even thinking about you anyway. You know, you, you're surrounded with all kinds of problems. You're surrounded with all kinds of you know, negative things. You're surrounded with all kinds of things that you and I don't like. You're surrounded by darkness in America. We're surrounded by all kinds of political pressures and demonic forces and all kinds of ideologies. And if you and I get our eyes on those things, they'll start to control our lives. During the pandemic, the Lord spoke to me and said this. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, you have one assignment during the whole pandemic. And I said, what's that? I love the way he keeps it simple. He said, you need to see every lost person as a sheep without a shepherd. You have to look beyond all their ideologies, all the darkness, all the stuff. And I began to realize that often we're surrounded by things that we don't know how to deal with. And we get our eyes on the wrong things. And what the enemy tries to do is surround us with evil, with darkness. And, and the, the world is full of evil and darkness. We live in a fallen world. And one time I was at a thing that we have called man prayer. Man Prayer is a group of men that started to pray about 15 years ago. And I, I wanted to stir the men up to be like David's mighty army, to be mighty men of valor. And so we started the prayer meeting. I said, we're going to pray for 20 minutes alone in the sanctuary. We're going to be here at 6 o'clock every Friday morning. Then you're going to pray in a large circle with all the men for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then we're going to get in smaller groups and pray for about... 20 or 30 minutes, depending on if you have to go to work or whatever. Started with a handful of people. At the height of it, 173 men showed up. Man prayer went into five nations. We never asked anybody to join. We just started to pray in a little warehouse in Everett, Washington. And God started to show up. And we started to realize that we've, we've been inundated by the media, by all kinds of things, to be surrounded, just like Elisha was surrounded. I was in that prayer meeting, and I got up off, I got up off the, the ground one day to get, to get in the larger circle, and, and I, heard, I heard a voice say, uh, you better surrender, you're surrounded. Of course, as a man, I don't like the word surrender, so I said, I'm not going to surrender to the enemy. And the Lord said, this isn't the enemy, it's me. And he said, I'm going to teach you some things. He said, yes, you're surrounded by the enemy, but you're surrounded by me. And he said, whatever surrounding you surrender to will control your life. Never thought of it that way. It says the earth is full of the goodness of God. The earth is full of the goodness of God. Now, a lot of people, all they see is the earth being full of darkness, evil. They get fixated on that stuff. Whatever you start to look at, you become like. Whatever you start to think about starts to change your mind. We're surrounded by God's presence. We're surrounded by the king of kings. We're surrounded by the angel armies of God. The angels of God watch over us. And we've been given authority, and we need to have our eyes open to the things of the Spirit. Amen. And God wants to get the eyes of the church back on Jesus and back on the things of the Spirit. If you and I live outside the will of God for our lives, we cannot please God. 
Jesus said, my food, what feeds me, when he, they brought back the meat in John 4, he said, my food, my, what, what sustains me is to do the will of him who sent me. He said, I have a food to eat that you don't know anything about. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. My life at 70 years of age, I've been saved 48 years, August 11th, out of drug addictions, out of alcoholism, out of two nervous breakdowns. God set me free. And my whole life is his. My life's no longer my own. People said, why do you travel all over the world? Where do you go to these places nobody else wants to go to? I said, because my life's not my own. He bought me 48 years ago, beer cans and all. He bought the whole field. He bought all the drug stuff. He, he took it all. So when... When the enemy comes back and says, I say, no, don't talk to me. Jesus bought it all. Take, you have to talk to him. He bought it. It's not mine any longer. And you're surrounded. And these great cloud of witnesses were men and women that obeyed a word from God. It says that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And a lot of people think that speaks of creation. I don't personally think it speaks of creation. It's the word aeons. It means the ages were framed by the word of God. It means the ages were framed by men and women who heard a word from God in simple obedience, did what God told them, and their obedience changed the course of nations. You have no idea what your obedience as a man, your obedience as a son of God, your authority that God's given you being used in your home and your family and your neighborhood, you can make a difference anywhere you go. And what you put your eyes on, you begin to trust in. What you keep focused on, people start to trust. You know what I did during the pandemic when everybody was sending out videos of all the conspiracy theories in America? I sent out scriptures to people in prophetic words. They go, Pastor, you got I said, please don't send those things to me. They what did they do? What was the fruit of those things after all these years? Nothing. Nothing. But frustration and people not knowing a clue what was going on. And we were out witnessing to people and praying for the sick and casting out demons. We were out loving people in our community. We went to the gospel center and told the gospel center there's only two cooks because nobody else can go in there. We'll, we'll bring our church people and we'll cook all the meals for the people at every gospel mission. We went to the hospitals and took meals to the nurses and gave things to the hospital, the doctors. We went to the schools and honored the teachers and took things to them. They said we were the only group in the community that thanked them for what they did. We went to the high school that's the most... The most uh, of all nationalities, probably in the whole state of Washington, one of the high, largest high schools, we started taking Christmas presents to all the families that didn't have Christmas presents. And we told them we're the goodness army. They go, the what? And I said, the goodness army. God said I could start a goodness army. So I started a goodness army. We went wherever the darkness was and the evil, and we did good things. We helped people that nobody else wanted to help. We manifested the goodness of God. Do you know that the church, is, the church doesn't really know how good God is? God's you know what? God is way... I came here to tell you that God's not as good as you think he is. I came all the way to Nova Scotia to tell you God is not as good as you think he is. He's way better. And we sing songs like, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good. And we have no clue how good he is. And we started to release the goodness of God. And the Lord told me, if you can begin to see the goodness of God, you can begin to receive the goodness of God. And if you receive the goodness of God, then you can release the goodness of God. Amen. You see the goodness of God in creation. God said, look, all of creation, he created, said, this is good, this is good, this is good. There's only one thing God said was not good. When he saw Adam alone, he said, this is not good to have man alone. Can you imagine a planet without women? It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? There'd be a lot of pizza parties and a lot of sporting events and Probably some beer, knowing most men, but... Dirty clothes. Yeah, dirty clothes. A lot of talk. Right? They said, that's not good. All of creation. You look around, you look at the beautiful place that God's created in Nova Scotia. One of the most beautiful places in the world. All of creation reflects his goodness. It's so powerful when you look at his goodness. And then I realized, you know, when I started to look for the goodness of God, that he, he, he kept sneaking up on me. Have you ever had God kind of sneak up on you? And it says in Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And I started to kind of look over my shoulder, and I realized that God was following me with his mercy and goodness everywhere I went. And it started to spill out on other people. And I started to look for it, and it started to show up in restaurants. It started to show up in homes. It started to show up in schools started to show up in places I was even surprised it showed up. 
And then in the middle of it all, God gave me four of the dreams. He said, I'm going to overwhelm you with my goodness. I go, God, you've already over. He said, I'm going to really overwhelm you. He said, he said, you're going to have to get over yourself. He said, a lot of the church will not allow me to show my goodness because they get into false humility and they don't want people to think that they're something. And so it limits my goodness from being manifest through them. He says, I'm going to mess you up really bad. I'm going to, I'm going to prop my goodness so much it's going to overwhelm you and you're going to have to get over yourself because you're really not that impressive. And many of you don't realize the incredible mission and the part you have in Jesus' mission. You are men that are on a mission. I'm on a mission. I'm 70 years young. I'm just starting to feel like I'm just starting to grow up. And God's opening doors all over the world, all over places. And I knew that he told me to come here. I felt something four years ago. I said, there's going to be a revival in Nova Scotia that's going to shake nations. And the the younger generation needs older men that will pour their lives into them, that will champion them, support them, pray for them. My joy is to pour into the younger generation. God's got wild adventures for people that will just be obedient. And some of you say, oh, I'm just trying to get through to next week. And I go, what a terrible, you need to recalibrate. God's kingdom is moving. We're in the last days. This is going to be the most exciting times the church has ever known. I, know, I want to be in the middle of everything. I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to be home watching TV or going fishing, although I like to go fishing, or playing golf. I like to golf, but I'll tell you, there's nothing that compares to doing the will of God. And the presence of God is here. And the hand of God is on many of you that you're going to be propelled in this next season of your life to a new mission, to be recalibrated, to realize all the gifts, all the callings God has placed on you. This is the time to step up to release those things into people's lives. People say, well, I failed. I said, so we all have. Who hasn't failed? I'd rather fail forward, though, than fail backward and just give up. I learned from my failures. Failures teach us a lot. It teaches us not to do it again. I think some prophetic things. There's going to be some things stirred up in you. Some of you need to stir up your gifts. Some of you need to stir up those callings that are on your life. I don't know if something got stirred in you, but there's people in this room that God's reminding you that you've been surrounded by the goodness of God. He wants you to see the goodness. He wants you to get your eyes on the goodness and fixed on the goodness of God. He wants you to trust. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose eyes are stayed upon me because you trust in me. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, you're trusting in him. You're relying on him. And there's some of you here that the call of God's on your life. And some of you said, well, I, I knew the call of God when I was young, but you know, I, I didn't. I said, it's time to come back to the call of God. Doesn't matter what age you are. Doesn't matter if you're 95. Doesn't matter if you're 120. Doesn't matter if you're 17. God has a call on people's lives in this room to bring the goodness of God, to bring the surrounding of God like Elisha. And think about it. He said, open his eyes. And his servant just had his eyes on the circumstances. He just had his eyes on the natural. But what happened? When he said, open his eyes, he began to see the holy angels. He began to see the, the army of God surrounding Elisha. And then he blinded the whole Syrian army by one prayer. And he was just available. Elisha followed Elijah, served him, was obedient to the call of God in his life, and he became one of the greatest prophets Israel ever knew. So, Father, we thank you tonight. Can you stand with me? If God, if God, if God spoke to you tonight, I had a different message plan. But when I heard John lead the songs he led, I, I just started to sense that God was changing the message. He's free to do whatever he wants. He's way gooder than you think. He has good plans for you. He's going to surround you with his goodness. He's going to surround you with songs of deliverance. He's going to surround you in Psalm 125 with a forevermore like he surrounds Jerusalem. If you've been to Jerusalem, there's mountains around Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. He's going to surround you with his presence. In your presence, Lord. Yes, Lord. In your presence. In your presence, Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Life. Life. In your presence, Lord. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your presence, Lord. 
Some of us are limiting ourselves because of what we're thinking in our head. God's not asking you to think your way into worship. He's asking you to open your spirit. Open your heart. Open your spirit. With the heart, man believes to salvation. And with the mouth, confession is made to righteousness. So with our heart, we reach out to God. And with our mouth, we confess. We agree. That word confession means I agree. When it says that we confess our sins and our faults to God, it means we just agree with what he says is right and what he says is wrong. And we agree in spite of it as to who we are in him. It comes back to our identity like we've been talking about this weekend. Who are you? Your sons. Your sons. You're home in the Father's house. You're free to be in the Father's house. I have a son. He makes mistakes. <laughs> and guess what? He's still my son. <laughs> He's still at home in my house. Everything I have, he has access to it. And the goal is that that's going to cause him to be raised up to be the man that he needs to be. And God has given you access to everything he has. He wants to raise you up to become what he's called you to be. He's put it in you. He wants to draw it out of you. The presence of God is like the sun that shines on a flower and it opens up that bud and makes it that beautiful blossom that it's meant to be. That's what the sun, Jesus, does for you. He opens you up. He makes you who you're meant to become because it's already in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's not worship God with our head. Open your spirit. Let's drop down into our spirit and flow with the Lord. Let's flow with the Lord. Flow with the Lord. Begin to open up and begin to thank God. Begin to praise Him. Begin to speak out who it is He's made you to be. Speak out the realities that you've learned this weekend, that shame no longer has a home in your heart. Guilt no longer has a home in your heart. That freedom has come to you. New life has come to you. Prosperity in the kingdom has come to you. Prosperity in your relationships has come to you. Transformation has come. Let's begin to embrace those realities by faith. Begin to speak it out to God. Say, thank you, God. This is what you've done in my life. This is what I receive by the power of the Spirit. He's welcome here. He's welcome. He's welcome in everything that he is. In your presence, Lord. In your presence, Lord, you're everything I need. You're everything I want. You supply everything. Your presence, Lord, all your miracles, all your wonders, all your signs. In your presence, Lord, your life, your healing, your restoration. It's in your presence, Lord. It's where you are. It's where you are in your presence. In your presence, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, my teacher. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere, my guide. It's what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Open us up. Let us experience. So I was given, uh, this is a message a couple weeks ago. Those guys in there, that's my Zoom church in there. Some of it. Some of it. Yeah, some are here. Um, Exodus 10, 24 and 25. And oddly enough, this is Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's having a discussion with Moses about leaving Egypt. Moses said, let my people go. And, Mo and Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. 10.24. Let's see where it goes. Yeah, Exodus 10.24. And Moses summoned, and Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord, even your children and, and women may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. He said, you can get out of here, get out of Dodge, you can leave, you can be completely free of every kind of slavery, the only thing you have to do is leave your money behind. So it's about finances. And so what God is talking about here is our finances. And I thought, you know, I thought I knew every financial scripture that there was in the Bible. And, you know, we're, and part of the thing that I see in the church is that people are not aligned financially. 
Like they, 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 you know, there, there's discipline, there's prayer, there's Bible study, there's, you know, good works and all the rest of it. But financially, yeah. people are not aligned. God's financial advice is to invest in human equity, yeah. relationships. Amen. And some of us, you know, some of us have a hard time trying to make friends and, and be, you know, that's hard. But the other, other thing is, is it's like, you know what? Jesus... Jesus makes friends with the sinners. He goes out of his way to treat everybody with respect and honor and love. Golly, um, we do a bunch of things that are recalibration. And I think a lot of you folks, too, are recalibrators. You just don't know it. Or you just like maybe you're thinking it. It's just like, you know, and I heard someone say, oh, he left, uh, that I'm either in recalibration or I'm disobedient because some pastor somewhere where would say you know you can't do that because it's new and it's exciting and you know God's mercies are new every day the other morning yesterday morning I got up early and I'm I had two cups of tea and my stomach started to hurt because I hadn't eaten anything and I thought well I'm eating breakfast here but I got to eat something and I've already told some of you that I'm on a limited diet my wife limits my diet. And it's just like, I was just like happy here because there's no limits. And uh, so anyway, I, I, every morning I have a piece of toast, two eggs, and a banana for my potassium. So, <laughs> just saying. So I thought, well, I can have a piece of, so she butters the toast, which means there's no butter on the toast and there's nothing, it's like it's, so anyway, I had a piece of toast, and I buttered my toast, and I put jam on it, and I ate that. And it's just like, golly, you forget how good goodness is. This is like, this is so good. And I remember at the time thinking, you know what? It's just like, oh, I love my wife. She's so good to me because she just wants to limit my diet, and this is like, this is good. And then I thought, you know, this is like what life is like with her. Like toast with bread and jam. It's just really good. I love her. And and then then the song, I love bread and butter. I like toast and jam. What's this? It's like an, it's like and then so anyway, I thought it was kind of cute and I was telling Jerry about that and then Jer and then Jerry said, Well that's just like the scripture that I that I really love when I first came to the Lord was taste and see that the Lord is good. And so the Lord was telling me that, you know, part of what this whole meeting is about is about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. But the Father is kind. He's really kind. And you know, you probably know the scriptures. But there's a scripture that I want to tell you about that um, I landed on. It's just as good as Exodus 10. And it's in Proverbs 46, 9. This is so good. It's like if there was one scripture that you could land on that would get you through the hardest day you ever had, through your troubles, the darkest day, um, just bolster your hope. Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And I will give you this moment Put my world far behind me Fall at your feet I will seek you Completely With all of my heart Until you have all of me Take all of me Take all Take
Is that your cry this morning, this afternoon? That every part of our heart would be his. Every concern that we have carried, if we lay it at his feet, we give everything to him. He says that he goes before us. He watches over us. And his heart is so much for us. He's got a plan and a purpose in all things. In all things. We'll work out. Even when we can't see it. 